Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Jens Chapman, and we're live from Seattle. It's November 20, 2020. And uh, I'm wearing a mask because we're under full lockdown again here in the wave three or how many waves we ever have. Today's topic is one that uh, seemingly is not on the vocabulary of a lot of spine surgeons. And of course, all of us have been indoctrinated with the gospel of pelvic tilt and lumbar lordosis alignment versus uh, inclination versus uh, this and that. We all are inundated with numbers and we put patients into number categories of alignment, which is important because as the great Jean Dubusset told us, we have a cone of efficiency, and when we're out of this cone of efficiency, we suffer, and our spine suffers. But the bigger picture is one of this phenomenon called Kempto-Cormy. I want to credit my partner, Dr. Rado Skuyan, for having said, look, and put out the challenge in our group, let's look at the big picture. Let's see what this actual forward bending may entail beyond the numbers. So let's call this journal club Beyond the Numbers and go a little bit on a deeper dive as to what this forward bending of the spine that we can paraphrase as Kempto-Cormia, a great all-encompassing phrase, may entail, and which we may as clinicians want to think about as we're looking at what we're doing. Without much further ado, a gentleman who you've not seen here before with us too much is one of our wonderful interventional spine fellows, Dr. James Ying. We have a great interventional spine program here. They had a great course last weekend uh, with their leader, Dr. David Glenn, uh, Glenn David. And uh, he had an all-star interventional program here um, uh, at the Seattle Science Foundation. So Dr. Ying, tell us a little bit further about what you're talking about in terms of Camptocormia and neuromuscular disease. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. So my name is James Ying. I'm the interventional spine fellow here at uh, Swedish. And today I'm gonna talk about DBS as a treatment for Parkinson's disease-related Camptocormia. Uh, here's a review article published by Dr. Chen in 2015. So a brief intro, uh, Parkinson's disease uh, prevalence is about 630,000 in the US. Uh, severe postural deformities uh, are pretty common in later stages, uh, including camptochormia, which occurs in about three to 12.2% of the cases. Uh, Camptochormia is defined as a significant forward flexion of the thoracolumbar spine, which resolves, interestingly, in a recumbent position. Uh, first described in World War I soldiers who were walking with their uh, back bent through their trenches, uh, developing this condition. And it comes with a significant disability, low back pain, uh, sagittal misalignment and falls, as well as autonomic symptoms. Uh, DBS was first introduced in 2002 for this condition uh, in primary dystonia patients. And currently there's no consensus for optimal treatment approach. So this review article used the MESH terms listed here uh, and then found 361 uh, articles in PubMed and then they excluded uh, 340 of these because they were editorial commentary review or they were talking about chemotocormia of non-PD origin and they were left with 21 studies uh, for this review. And they had a total of 131 patients in these articles and with the characteristics of a 61 point eight years of age, 44% um, male, and the mean year to age of onset of PD was 54.2, and then the onset of camptochormia uh, in these patients was 5.4 after the uh, initial symptoms of PD. Here's a list of patient uh, articles that talked about uh, medical treatments uh, for these patients, and uh, 42 patients uh, who took levodopa, uh, had a mixed results, about half improved, the other half did not have improvement. Uh, 27 patients had intramuscular injections, uh, most of which was lidocaine, but there were also a third that were Botox. And the patients who received lidocaine injections uh, had 71% uh, of the patients improved, uh, while the Botox group had mixed results. And the patients who had injections to the external oblique and rectus abdominis had better results compared to internal oblique. Two patients also received intrathecal baclofen with no benefit. Uh, here's a list of articles who uh, studied the DBS for chemtochormia. As you can see, most of the articles were case series, case report, with uh, one prospective uh, study as well as one retrospective study. And in, as you can see in the intervention column, most of the DBS were implanted in the bilateral sublamic nucleus, 
uh, with three patients uh, implanted in the bilateral globus pallidus. Total of 47 patients were in these articles. 68% uh, of this group showed significant improvement, and that was documented by a score, uh, the UPDRS, the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, uh, which studied uh, patients' questionnaire, including mobility, self-care, mentation, and treatment complications. And it ranged from a zero to 199 scale, uh, from no disability to total disability. And the results showed that DBS was able to decrease the score uh, in the Parkinson's disease on state uh, from 32 to 16.7, and in the off state of Parkinson's disease from 50 to 20.7. Uh, pretty significant results, especially in the off state. And they also studied different uh, stimulation sites as well. Uh, most of the patients received subthalamic nucleus uh, with a decrement of 45.1%, uh, uh, and a 60.9% on and off state. Uh, the globus pattus implantation had a less um, improvement uh, with a decrement of 4 and a 36.4%. Two, two of the articles also documented improvement in VAS as well, 40% and 13%. And one of the articles also documented uh, adverse, effect, uh, adverse events after these implantation including skin erosion at the IPG site, as well as one patient who developed prolonged depression. Uh, there was also a couple of articles that talk about spine surgery uh, for uh, cryptochromia, and these showed improvement in posture, quality of life, as well as subjective symptoms, but they also came in with uh, more complications, including fixation failure uh, and requiring multiple revision operations, as well as more uh, morbidity after the operation. There were some objective data about this intervention as well uh, with the documentation of the mean bending angle uh, after intervention. And as you can see, after spine surgery, it had the greatest change in improvement uh, with 84.4 and 89.9% improvement in the mean bending angle. Uh, however, as you can see that the pre-op uh, bending angle was less than those patients who study in the DBS uh, group. Uh, which had uh, up to 78.2% improvement in the mean bending angle. A brief discussion, the pathogenesis currently of the camptochromia is unknown. Uh, there are theories about potentially involvement of dystonia of the truncal flexor muscles, as well as the focal myopathy of truncal extensors, uh, as well as the central neuronal pathway dysfunction uh, in alignment as uh, patients who had greater response to levodopa had more improvement after DBS implantation. Uh, DBS uh, fixes this central neuronal circuit, and uh, as a result, that, that's a theorized uh, method for improving, improving this alignment. Uh, this uh, DBS is usually indicated in cases refractory to medication, as well as patients who can't tolerate medication due to side effects. And the implantation sites, they theorize that for globus pattus, implantation had a better effect for primary and secondary dystonia, while subthalamic nucleus may potentially have a better uh, effect for Parkinson's disease uh, patients. And the timing of DBS was discussed in one of the articles. Uh, they felt early DBS was uh, associated with improved outcome. Ultimately, the conclusion was that this review had a positive results for patients uh, uh, with DBS for treatment of uh, PD and camptochromia. However, more data is needed and larger trials are still needed. James. James, thank you. This was excellent. Mm -hmm. So I want to pick up on what you just said last. As a clinician, I'm always perturbed in how often I find Parkinson's uh, syndrome, which means it comes with a wide variety of manifestations and disease severity, is not diagnosed or identified. Mm -hmm. And it's a difficult disease because it's uh, multiform in its presentations. Um, you mentioned that the disease severity um, is kind of, uh, in part, a significant variable in terms of uh, good outcomes with DBS. Yet the ongoing mantra of neurologists is to treat these pharmacologically and not with DBS. So 
What are your thoughts in terms of what is the critical threshold? Is it a time period? Is that a lack of success of medicational treatment? Uh, when to trigger the DBS management? Yeah, exactly. That's a great question. So DBS currently is uh, indicated in patients who are refractory to medication. So medication is definitely the first line still at this moment. And patients who develop chemotochromia uh, with significant in symptoms, especially using the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale, uh, will definitely, if they meet the criteria for DBS, uh, they will benefit from DBS uh, at this point. Uh, surgery is little patients, mostly more for patients who are uh, who has myelopathy or radiculopathy, and they those patients are more beneficial for from a surgical standpoint. And those without myelopathy and without radiculopathy, uh, potentially DBS without surgery uh, is recommended. But from everything that we know in terms of Parkinson's, one of the key things is to try to keep these patients as straight as possible mm -hmm. and function as much as possible in terms of their neuromuscular access as normal human beings, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, and we also know that the pharmacologic therapy is bound to fail simply over time. It's mm -hmm. a matter of dose escalation and uh, uh, some pharmacologic variation but the end game is always the same. You basically burn out your receptors and mm -hmm. um, you're, you're bound to, to go down. So wouldn't it be better to start them earlier on DBS and find out who the bad actors are in terms of uh, f going to fail pharmacologic therapy than waiting for people to really go forwards? Yeah, it seems like, it, especially with that article that talked about the timing of DBS, the earlier DBS that did have better outcomes uh, than their DBS. So that, that's likely. Final, final question on this uh, topic, uh, for me at least, uh, is um, how long did the therapeutic benefit last uh, with these DBSs? What was the longest follow-up that you could find? Uh, let's see. They had a slide on that, but it went by fast. Right, the length of a follow-up up to 60 months, uh, which in that article um, marked the improvement leading to reduction in medication dosage. So yeah. these are all very small patient groups still. These exactly, are basically yeah. modified case years despite trying to create a meta-analysis. Right. So level four evidence. Yeah. But thanks for bringing this up. Are there any comments? I don't see any in the chat. Ben, yeah, I've, uh, I've got a couple of Fire away. A, a query more than anything else uh, for discussion and consideration. I, I've now collected a number of patients that have come after spinal cord stimulator placement who have developed essentially a camptocornea. They're bent over, they're hunched, and I've asked them to bring photographs of them before the spinal cord stimulator, and then a year and two years and three years after, and they've got this progressive uh, spinal imbalance, sagittally and coronally with undefinable curves. So here we're, we're listening to someone who's telling us that deep brain stimulation, modifying the electrical signal is helping these patients, yet is there a link with spinal cord stimulation causing some of this problem? So I'll ask Dr. Ying because uh, Dr. David and his team are very active in putting spinal cord stimulators, which again, I just wanna make sure that the audience understands is very different from DBS, um, very, very different conceptually and uh, intentionally. Um, uh, what have you found in terms of treatment failures of spinal cord stimulators? Yeah, so there were one randomized control trials listed here at the, at the third at the bottom here. Uh, had uh, 37 patients. They showed an overall improvement uh, in uh, in Parkinson's disease in, uh, and camptochromia. And as you can see in the, the bottom here as well, the spinal cord stimulator had a 51.6 degree uh, pre-op and then 40.7 degree post-op. Uh, after spinal cord stimulation with the kind of 11% or sorry, 11 degrees of improvement and 21% improvement. So potentially they could have some small uh, benefit as well after a sti stimulator placement. So uh, Dr. Lieberman, I want to just second what you said, but this is an entirely anecdotal statement. Exactly. As the um, uh, use of spinal cord stimulators has expanded, the number of treatment failures within spine to me, uh, a uh, reconstructive surgeon has become more and more apparent, but I'm not sure that this is caused by the stimulators, whether this is just an overuse. I mean, I see this very meritorious technology being used in uh, situations where I see a clear case of a structural failure 
of mm -hmm. the spinal column with significant neurologic uh, outcroppings, and I don't see the merit in my limited surgical understanding of uh, SCS. So this is an ongoing uh, uh, rate of discovery, and I'd be happy to collaborate, uh, as would be our team here, uh, with your center and uh, others uh, to look at causes of failed uh, SCS uh, in our series, because we have them regularly. We explant them regularly, but mm -hmm. uh, we don't know what the other side of the medal is, how many have been saved from spine surgery with these technologies. Yeah, definitely. Any comment on that, James? So yeah, that would be very useful, definitely, yeah, especially when the pathogenesis of the chemical is currently unknown. Yeah, how the stimulator may or may not help. Yeah, we don't, at this point, we don't, yeah. But for me, an undeniable take-home message of James's talk is we as spine surgeons should be aware of picking up neuromuscular diseases and identifying and help identifying uh, um, Parkinson's disease and all its permutations. Is no. that a fair statement, Dr. Lieberman? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we see a lot of neurological issues. We see a lot of structural issues. And we can be the quarterbacks for these patients and get them the right treatment. We have a full agenda. We'll move on. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ravi Nuna. And he's one of our excellent spine fellows. Thank you, James, for a great and thought-provoking uh, discussion. And here we go, Ravi. All right. Thank you, Dr. Chapman, for that kind introduction. So I'm going to be reviewing a 2018 article in the uh, Journal of Neurosurgery. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis of surgical management treatment options in the uh, treatment of acamptochormia in Parkinson's disease. Um, I will defer to James's um, comprehensive introduction on this disease state, but generally speaking, incidence of camptochormia in Parkinson's disease is estimated at around 7%. Uh, First-line therapies are all non-surgical in nature. That can include corsets, um, levodopa, or other pharmacologic agents, in addition to botulinum toxin and lidocaine injections. Um, surgical options have consisted of uh, repetitive transpinal magnetic stimulation, which um, coincidentally this article included in the surgical management cohort. Um, we'll get into that more later. Uh, DBS, deep brain stimulation, as well as uh, spinal deformity surgery. The aim of this study was um, twofold. There was a systematic review of surgical options for camptochormia, um, essentially a narrative review, in addition to a meta-analysis of DBS treatments in PD patients with camptochormia to investigate potential uh, prognostic indicators of success. Uh, initially, they used a couple different MESH terms, and they had 107 studies. After exclusion, they included nine total studies. Um, for the meta-analysis portion of this study, the inclusion criteria included uh, six months of average follow-up time, clear quantitative sagittal bending angle measurements before and after the DBS unit was placed, at least four patients in the, in the, pop, in the uh, cohort, and where DBS was the only surgical intervention. The exclusion criteria was any DBS procedures targeting the GPI. And as we previously just went over, um, options include both uh, the subthalamic nucle nucleus and GPI placement, but the STM therapy is um, more historically used in this patient population. Outcome variables that uh, the meta-analysis assessed was a change in sagittal bending angle, either less than or greater than 15 degrees or less than or greater than 50%, age less than or greater, greater than 60 years, and then a duration of camptochormia of either greater than or less than two years. This is a, an amalgamation of these studies of surgical options in uh, camptochormia. Um, as you can see, the first is the one that we just um, mentioned. It was a study out of Japan of 37 patients looking at transpinal repetitive magnetic stimulation, which actually is not the same as um, the invasive spinal cord stimulator. This is a totally external system where they have a coil placed on the worst angle, and then they use uh, repetitive magnetic stimulation to essentially have an effect on the mus muscles in the area. And then all these middle uh, studies are all uh, DBS studies, all with um, the leads placed in the subthalamic nucleus, and then finally also included a case series with um, only two patients of spinal fixation. I think we have some um, follow-up presentations on uh, other surgical outcome studies. 
So um, just a quick aside, for re repetitive transpinal magnetic stimulation, this study was 37 patients. They hypothesized that the effect was secondary to an effect on um, afferent sensory fibers and disruption of akinetic corticostriatal activity. This is a sham controlled randomized control study. They either had patients have a real coil or a sham coil during these, um, during these therapies, and they found that the average angle decreased um, 10.9 degrees in the, uh, in the actual cohort versus about zero in the uh, sham cohort. Now, the, the rest of the meta-analysis was based on DBS for camptochormia, and this cohort had 66 total patients. Um, the percentage of patients who had over a 15 degree decrease in sagittal plane bending angle was about 51%, and um, it was about the percentage of patients who had over a 50% decrease in sagittal plane bending angle was 36.4%. So um, reasonably, reasonably positive outcomes. And this is a uh, table summarizing some of these studies. And as you can see, they found that uh, younger patients were associated with a greater reduction in sagittal plane bending angle, in addition to patients that had camptochormia for less than two years. So um, this preliminary analysis suggested that younger patients and uh, patients that have not suffered from camptochormia for um, greater than two years would be better surgical um, patients. They did do several forest plots for review. This one was the only one that was significant and um, in included four of the studies finding that uh, shorter camptochormia duration was predictive of a greater than 15 degree decrease in sagittal plane bending angle with a, a significant odds ratio of 4.15. Um, the other two forest plots that they created were not significant, and they found that shorter camptochormia duration was not predictive of a greater than 50% decrease in sagittal plane bending angle. In addition, they also found that younger age in this um, deeper analysis was not predictive of a 50% uh, decrease in sagittal plane bending angle. So overall, um, this study, in terms of the meta-analysis, found that uh, subthalamic nucleus DBS therapy worked for some patients but was inconsistent in terms of overall benefit. Uh, their meta-analysis found that uh, patients that had camptochormia for less than two years, um, this was predictive of a larger decrease in sagittal plane bending angle following STN DBS therapy. Um, they excluded uh, GPI therapy for DBS just because it was limited to a small case series. And the evidence for spinal fusion was deemed as um, limited, especially because in this, um, in this series of studies, you know, this study only had two patients. So the, the, the primary limitations of this study, you know, similar to the last studies Dr. Chapman alluded to, is the level of evidence here. And as we can see, this is very, very small sample sizes in addition to amalgamating level of evidence is between two and four. So um, a little troubling when, you know, when we're creating meta-analyses because um, historically these, you know, you want meta-analysis to be level one evidence and you want to be um, combining um, really, really high level of evidence <coughs> studies to kind of create um, guidelines uh, in these patients. This study also did not include a, a bias or a heterogeneity analysis in terms of any, um, any issues in, in terms of this, and there was no funnel plots included. And again, there was also very, very um, small sample sizes. But overall, I think that this is a very, very rare patient population, and um, these patients are, don't come around too often, and I think that we don't really have the best answer. So, um, you know, this is gonna be an issue that's gonna continue into the future as we have very, very small um, sample sizes, but we need to find uh, the best therapies to help these patients. Thank you, Robbie. Um, so this is, again, a, a great surgeon perspective on the similar topic. And I want to make one thing very clear. Camptochormia is not synonymous with spinal decompensation uh, due to Parkinson's. This is a multifactorial process that leads right. to a forward bending and loss of physiologic posture, of which neuromuscular disease like Parkinson's is one example. Is that a fair summary? That's absolutely fair, yeah. This study only looked at Parkinson's patients, but generally speaking, camptochormia can include non-neuromuscular patients as well. In the chat room, Dr. Jennifer Witt asked a great question. I want to thank her for that. Did you or did uh, um, James find any evidence of myopathy, so extensive muscle myopathy, 
predicting poor outcomes and failure for DBS? So this meta-analysis at least did not look at myopathy at all. However, um, you know, this is pure conjecture, but I would assume that, you know, myopathy does um, factor in to the pathogenesis of this disease state. It would have to on some degree. Because for me, this is one of the big prognostic uh, factors that is negative. If a patient can't recruit, the, for instance, glutei, um, they will do very poorly with a long fusion. They just have nothing to hold them up. And exactly. so they just walk forward tilted with a rigid spine. So uh, empirically, I would have to say Dr. Witt is spot on. And I think we should somehow maybe refine our way to look at how patients can recruit their posterior muscle chain, their posterior chain for success for surgery, for instance. Right, and I think, you know, interestingly enough, the single study out of Japan about uh, transpinal magnetic stimulation, that's one of the um, hypotheses for how, why this therapy is effective is apparently, you know, it supposedly helps these muscle groups. Now, Izzy, you have, with Dr. Haddad, who gave a great talk uh, last week that I unfortunately missed, you have one of the leading kind of uh, uh, neuromotor uh, biomechanical engineers in the country, if not in the world, with you in your lab. Can you identify uh, posterior chain myopathies with your motion analyses? I don't know the answer to that, if we can be that specific with it. I'm checking to see the participants, see if, if Rum is Rum on. Rum is with on. I saw him in the... There. I saw him on the panelist group. He's logged in, but he's not on the he's doc panelist group. But maybe you can ask him off uh, offline and then inform us. Yeah, would that be okay? Uh, I know we can do um, surface and fine wire EMG, and uh, we may be able to isolate some of the individual muscle groups uh, with that. Uh, but I don't know that that we have actually done that as as yet. So you, I, you will, can lead the I will charge. check with them. Let me, let me text them and see what, uh, what they Good. say about that. Right now. Thank you, Ravi. Great talk. Let's keep moving. Thank um, you. Dr. Elias Elias is going to come next. And I'll introduce him whilst he's logging on his uh, or checking in his computer. Dr. Elias Elias from Beirut, Lebanon. He's a neurosurgical graduate of the American University there. It's been a great pleasure and honor to have him here as he's exposed to American lockdowns and the chaos in our city compared to his own city in Beirut. And by the way, Seattle does not come out favorably in that comparison study. Good morning, Elias. Hi, Dr. Chapman. Lee? I got a smile out of him. That's, a, that's an advancement. <clears throat> we have to go past the security measures that we have in place for Elias. Thank you, Lee. I want to recognize Lee's help always in solving our tech problems. So any reason why I cannot hold it from here? <coughs> Sorry. Yep, we gotta go in here again and fix this computer. So again, Rod, you're on the microphone. Yeah. So again, I want to just bring home this point, camptocormia. Why did this not become more popular? And um, I just want to make clear that everyone understands, while we're talking a lot about Parkinson's, this is not just a Parkinson's manifestation, right? No, I mean, it's really a, um, I think uh, what I wanted to, the reason why I chose camptocormia for our topic is that it's truly a, um, uh, you know, neurological problem. Most of these patients, if you look at their plain x-rays, um, you know, there's no fracture, there's no, there isn't any structural issue. And in fact, when you look at these patients, you know, when you look at the, um, the MRIs of the paraspinal musculature, you can see a lot of atrophy and um, uh, a lot of, there's a lot of clinical signs and sy symptoms, but um, I think, you know, very little is understood in terms of, um, we kind of look at the outside, but it's, this is a, a deep brain problem, and Elias is going to bring up some uh, good articles as well. All right, go for it, Elias. So, good morning. My name is Elias. I'm one of the Spine Fellows here at Swedish. So, today I will present uh, this article 
It's entitled Surgical Treatment of uh, Spinal Disorders in uh, Parkinson's yes, Disease yes, Patients. Yes, it was published in uh, 2017 in the European Spinal Journal. <clears throat> so a little bit of introduction. Spinal uh, Parkinson disease patients, they usually suffer from posture alteration, uh, mainly both sagittal and coronal imbalance. They have uh, the stooped uh, posture, which uh, is a flexion of the hip, knees, uh, bending forward, and also flexion of the neck. Uh, this is they are mainly associated also with uh, spinal stenosis, instability, uh, they have a higher rate of osteoporosis, higher rate of fracture, and higher rate of axial pain. <clears throat> so there is an increasing trend of uh, spine surgeries uh, operated on uh, Parkinson disease patients over the last few years. However, the results are mixed, and uh, we don't have big series about uh, this subgroup of spine patients. So the aim of uh, this study was uh, to analyze the spinal disorders associated with Parkinson disease, uh, to provide the current evidence about their surgical treatment, outcome, and complications. Regarding the methods, uh, the authors uh, used the PubMed for their search. Uh, mesh terms were used, were, also, were all associated with Parkinson disease and sagittal uh, imbalance, sagittal and coronal imbalance. Uh, however, this is a narrative review. It is not, not a systematic review. So uh, first, uh, I mentioned sagittal alignment in Parkinson's disease. As I said, patients, they have uh, yeah. flexed hip, uh, flexed, uh, flexed knee, and they will, they will bend forward. And also notice that their neck, their neck is, fle is uh, flexed forward. So in 7% of the Parkinson's disease patients, this, bend, this bending will reach a high magnitude which is conventionally named as uh, camptochormia. So camptochormia in this paper uh, was not defined as, as Dr. Oskoyan said, like a general uh, uh, or a mixture of uh, multiple variables. Here it was uh, defined as a marked flexion uh, over the thoracolumbar area <coughs> of uh, more than 45 degrees that is uh, resolved by supine position. So this one was a flexible uh, bending compared to the compared to the pelvic kyphosis, which is a rigid kyphosis uh, or a rigid forward bending of the thoracic area, uh, and it is not retroverted or not fixed by uh, by lying down. Another association of uh, Parkinson's disease and uh, and uh, spine abnormalities is the anti collis, which is forward flexion of the neck uh, and the head. Uh, this is a semi-flexible or semi-rigid uh, uh, posture that uh, can also affect the global alignment of Parkinson's disease patients. Uh, other spinopelvic uh, misalignment is uh, the pelvic kyphosis. So, pelvic, uh, so Parkinson's disease patients have question mark uh, ability about retroverting their pelvis, hence uh, the term of pelvic kyphosis, and they have a lower ability to compensate uh, in the sagittal, uh, sagittal alignment. <clears throat> now, regarding the corona alignment, uh, two terms uh, were associated with uh, Parkinson's disease. One of them is the PISA syndrome, and the other one is the scoliosis. So PISA syndrome was, uh, was uh, coined as a flexible uh, lateral flexion of at least 10 degrees that is also uh, corrected by lying supine. However, the scoliosis is a rigid uh, deformity that is not uh, corrected by bending, uh, by bending on the, to the opposite side or by going into the supine position. Scoliosis in uh, Parkinson's disease patients uh, were, uh, as high, was uh, noted to be as high as 40 to 70% of the patients in Parkinson's disease. Other papers uh, reported uh, up to 80 or 90 percent of their patients had scoliosis. Uh, it is more prevalent in female than in males. Uh, mainly, it presents as a single curve, as opposed to the scoliosis in non-Parkinson <coughs> disease patients, with, which who can present with single or double curves. Mainly, uh, Parkinson disease uh, scoliosis in Parkinson disease patients, they do not respond to the L-dopa and they have more thoracic kyphosis. So now regarding spine surgery in uh, Parkinson's disease patient, we don't have enough uh, data in the literature uh, about this topic. 
however, we know that there are uh, uh, spine surgery is associated with high rate of complications, and uh, we don't know how to select this type of patients. So which which one should go to surgery, which one sh should avoid surgery? Complications are, uh, we have early and late complications. Early complications are like general complications, cardiac palmo and venous thrombosis. Late complications are mainly hardware loosening, revision, PJKs. However, despite the high rate of complications uh, in these patients, which can reach 50 to 70 percent, uh, we know that uh, Parkinson's disease patients, they report high rate of satisfaction up to 70 and 76 percent of times. Uh, the main cause of high failure rate is the poor bone quality, the osteoporosis, and high risk of fracture due to the loss of uh, proprioception, orthostatic uh, hypotension, and altered mu muscle tone. <clears throat> so we have lack of studies uh, regarding this topic. This is the only study that I found that contained a big series of uh, patients. Uh, the big series is only 48 patients. And it was published from France about uh, the long construct T3 to pelvis in patients with uh, Parkinson's disease and uh, spinal deformities. And they have a third, third, third result about good, doubtful, and failure and outcome. Limitation of the study is that this is a narrative review. So this is a level five evidence. And so they concluded that uh, Parkinson's disease patients have both sagittal and coronal mal malalignment which is prevalent in the subtypes of patients. Surgical outcome mainly is not satisfactory. However, clinical outcome is mostly satisfactory among the patients themselves. And there is a big lack of clinical and basic science studies regarding this field. Thank you. Thank you. So who should we operate and who should we not operate uh, when we have a patient with uh, Parkinson's disease uh, with a flexible curve? Should we, uh, are there any insights that you can share with us in terms of what the, um, the our authors identified as clear negative factors? So in the literature, there are no clear like variables to, to whom, for which patient we should operate or not. I think it's uh, still based on the on surgeon's preference. We should take into consideration the bone quality, the mental health of the patient, and uh, the general uh, possible outcome of every patient uh, with Parkinson's disease. And we should go first uh, with medical treatment uh, regarding Parkinson itself. I'm going to go to Dr. Amir Abdul-Jabbar with my mask on. Any thoughts on who we um, should, or what we should look for, what modifiable and what non-modifiable factors are kind of clear uh, precautionary tales? So I, I think <clears throat> with Parkinson's patients, um, you know, in, in my practice, I know I've always felt that because of the kind of central, we talked about myopathy earlier, um, I've always wanted to do a little bit more than I would in a normal functioning patient. Um, so obviously you want to address the underlying spinal disorder, um, but because of their myopathy, I think that you, they might need a little bit um, kind of longer construct. Um, so if you're thinking of doing a you know, single level fixation, you may want to think about doing a little bit more maybe um, going fixation to the pelvis, things like this. Again, I don't think it's supported by any um, really good evidence. Um, you know, something I, I would like to see done a little bit better. Um, and I think we should look at it. But um, my practice, I've, I've definitely seen some failures in Parkinson patients by not doing enough fixation. So this is the crux of the matter. And Dr. Teresa Bass just pointed out uh, how can we legitimize operating on patients when we have an over 50% uh, rate of complications. And you immediately tie into that by saying we actually need to do bigger surgery um, uh, to try to avoid failures. So Dr. Pruitt, yes, I just, yes I fire just away. Comment on that. Uh, one of the things I, I very frequently say, if you want to have a bad day in the operating room, you operate on someone with Parkinson's because of the complexity of the deformity and the osteoporosis and their medical comorbidities. But I do think we have to change our expectations in this group of patients. When these curves start to fall over, they are very debilitating. You know that tomorrow that Parkinson's patient is not going to be as healthy as he was the day before. 
So maybe our expectation should be arresting the progression of the deformity as opposed to trying to gain the corrections that we expect with the degenerative scoliosis or even with idiopathic scoliosis. So let's, let's look at realigning our expectations in combination with realigning the Parkinson's spine. Good statement. Great segue for Dr. Gayumi. Puria, take us forward. Yes, sir. Good morning, everyone. I'm Puria Gayumi, one of the fellows, and the uh, article that I'm presenting is titled Spinal Surgery for Parkinson's Disease with, Cam with Campicormia. It was published out of a group in South Korea. Uh, a bit of background. I know my uh, co-fellows went through the background of Campicormia pretty extensively, so I'm going to keep it short. Uh, but the way they define it in Parkinson's disease is uh, marked an reflection of the trunk, which uh, resolves with supine position and with no or minimal response to medications. It's generally worse with walking, and it resolves with sitting in supine position, as mentioned. They hypothesize that most of this is related to a, it's a dynamic deformity that is affected by posture because of the uh, secondary to degenerative changes in the extensor of uh, back and hip ex extensors. Uh, and, uh, they mentioned that there's no studies comparing surgical outcome and captocormia of the Parkinson's disease versus patients with uh, degenerative sagittal imbalance. Uh, the goal of the study was then to investigate the overall surgical outcomes uh, and the correction of campicormia on patients with Parkinson's disease uh, in a matched cohort study with patients with degenerative uh, sagittal imbalance. Uh, this was a retrospective cohort study. In terms of methods, uh, they retrospectively reviewed uh, ra a radiograph radiographic database uh, from 2010 to 2015. Uh, par uh, in, in terms of inclusion criteria, it was Parkinson's disease patients with more than five centimeters of uh, SVA, with minimal of two years of follow-up, more than five years of uh, fusion, and inclusion of the sacral pelvic fixation with bilateral iliac screws. Uh, they were able to identify and enroll 13 patients with uh, Parkinson's disease camptochormia. Uh, they used a one to two to a matched cohort uh, using propensity scores, and they use different uh, factors as uh, listed here. In terms of the radiographic measurements, uh, they did a very extensive um, measurements of all uh, um, pelvic uh, parameters as expected, including uh, PI, uh, pelvic tilt, sacral sacral slope, T1 and pelvic angle, uh, SVA, both at pre-op, three months, and their last follow-up. Uh, they also measured the amount of fatty changes in the paravertebral muscles and looked at the cross-sectional area of these muscles uh, as a ratio of muscles uh, to disc. In terms of clinical parameters, uh, they looked at multiple factors as listed here. Uh, they looked at VAS, ODI, and SRS22, at both preoperatively and postoperatively. Uh, and they looked at surgical outcomes, which included major complications, uh, reoperations, and they also looked at um, incidents of PJK and PJF, and they uh, uh, defined PJK as more than 10 degrees uh, of kyphosis greater than the pre-op measurements, and for PJF, uh, patients that were symptomatic with fracture at UIV or UIV plus one or in, uh, junctional subluxation. Uh, in terms of results, uh, there was no difference in demographics between the two groups. Um, for radiographic measurements, uh, they noticed that the pre-op cob and pelvic tilt was greater in patients with degenerative uh, sagittal imbalance. However, pre-op SVA was significantly greater in patients with camptochormia. Uh, Post-op pelvic tilt and coronal imbalance was similar between the two groups. However, the camptochormia group had a greater SVA correction postoperatively. However, subsequently at their last follow-up, they also had a greater loss of their SVA. Um, and they also noticed that the camptochormia uh, patients had a higher uh, rate of fatty changes in the muscles and the less cross-sectional uh, cross uh, uh, muscle to disc uh, ratio. Uh, this is uh, the table that basically reviews everything. I think the most uh, noticeable thing is the change in the SVA, both from pre-op to post-op, and then the loss of that SVA at their last, last follow-up in the camptochormia patients. Uh, in terms of PJF, uh, they had had uh, eight patients in the Camptochormia group uh, and only one in the degenerative group that uh, developed PJF, uh, and they uh, broke it down, but the uh, reason for the PJF was three of them were UIV fractures, uh, four in UIV plus one fractures, and one patient had an instrument failure. Uh, also in the Camptochormia patients, they had a uh, much shorter time to development of PJK slash PJF um, 
They also noticed that patients with the UIV at the thoracolumbar junction were associated with a higher rate of uh, uh, PJF, mm -hmm. and degree of fatty changes were also higher in patients with the, in the PJF group. They did a multivariate analysis, and they found that number of level fused and the degree of fatty changes preoperatively were both independent risk factors for development of PJF in uh, Camptochormia patients. In terms of clinical outcomes, they, they had a higher rate of reoperation in the Camptochormia group. It was seven versus two. Uh, ODI was higher in the Camptochormia group postoperatively, and they had more disability postop uh, in Camptochormia, uh, Camptochormia of uh, Parkinson's disease compared to the degenerative group. And the table kind of breaks down uh, all the complications, including the uh, PJA, PJK, and reoperation for these patients. In terms, in terms of strength and weaknesses of the study, they had a large number of uh, parameters they used, uh, especially in their matching. Uh, they did both radiograph, they looked at radiographic, clinical, and surgical outcomes for these patients. Uh, they had a small number of patients enrolled in the study, and uh, they also, as they mentioned, they didn't really correlate uh, these complications with the severity, the severity of the Parkinson's disease in these patients. Uh, for conclu uh, conclusion of the study, there was a greater pre-op uh, coronal and sagittal imbalance in the Camptochormia group, and they also had a greater loss of sagittal, uh, sagittal balance postoperatively. Uh, weakness and fatty degener uh, degeneration slash uh, infiltration was more severe in the Camptochormia group. They had a higher rate and also a more rapid rate of development of PJK and PJF postoperatively, and they hypothesized that this is uh, related to the weaker posterior tension band of these patients, uh, as mentioned, secondary to the higher rate of fatty degeneration of their muscles. Um, revision rate was higher, much higher, 53% uh, compared to 7% in the degenerative group, and uh, they had a higher ODI both pre-op and postoperatively. Uh, however, they did gain uh, improvement in their pain score uh, similarly between the two groups. So this is excellent. So one quick major summary. And can we have Dr. Freela start already logging his computer? And can you just ma uh, stay masked for a second? Absolutely. Mask? Mask yeah, okay, no, no, stay, yeah. st just move to the side. But Sven, get yourself logged in. So one thing that's very clear seems to be uh, lack of neuromuscular control of the trunk predisposes patients to a much higher, much, much higher right. risk of proximal junctional failure or kyphosis than uh, the opposite. That's Absolutely. a fair statement, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. So whilst some authors obsess about a couple of degrees of angle here or there and osteoporosis, all good points, mind you, lack of trunk muscle control seems to have a very major negative predisposing influence on outcomes in terms of complications, right? That's correct. So again, this would seem to me to be a call to action to try to be better about either an MRIs or electrodiagnostically or somehow functionally identify what extensor muscle function patients have and trying to modify that or modify our surgery towards a higher level surgery. Fair? Absolutely. Sorry, I'm asking leading questions. Absolutely. I'm a lawyer by heart. So now the question that I had about this article was they stopped their rostral fixation around the lower thoracic spine. When in fact, our own partner who couldn't be here this morning, Bob Hart, has published that for neuromuscular patients, stopping at the upper thoracic spine may actually predispose to less <coughs> proximal junctional failure. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, they mentioned that based on their findings that ending at thoracolumbar junction is a bad idea, but they did end at end of uh, thoracic, lower thoracic area, which I totally agree with you. Probably ending it at the upper thoracic would lead to less failure based on what they concluded. When I come to the difficult decision of operating on a patient with neuromuscular uh, deformity, I usually use that insight to think about going to the upper thoracic spine. Right. Uh, that's right there, uh, a, a therapeutic kind of a consequence for me. And I do realize that this adds about one to two hours extra surgery time with all associated blood loss and uh, duration of uh, surgical magnitude to the patient. But uh, this is a big deal for us, I think, to identify. Yep. Uh, Sven. Take us out of here. Thanks. Thank you, Puria. Thanks very much for the introduction, Dr. Chapman. My name is Sven Friela. I'm a research fellow here at the Swedish Neuroscience Institute. I'm originally from Germany, where I'm a resident at the University Hospital Bergmannsheil in Bochum. Um, today at our journal club, I'm presenting spinal fusion and Parkinson's disease patients uh, propensity score match analysis with minimum of two years surveillance. Um, the article was published in Spine 2019. The purpose of the study was to compare outcome and complication rates between patients with and without Parkinson's disease undergoing um, surgery for adult spinal deformity 
If we briefly look at the background, there's limited literature evaluating the impact of Parkinson's disease on uh, long-term outcomes after thoracolumbar fusion surgery for ASD. In general, adult spinal deformity encompasses a wide range of spinal disorders with multiple etiologies. Um, although non-surgical treatment options exist, surgery remains <coughs> the mainstay strategy and has been shown to improve health-related uh, quality of life scores. Um, but besides its success, um, adult spinal uh, deformity surgery has been associated with a very high rate of complications and patients must be selected carefully. Um, in addition, Parkinson's disease patients has been associated with a greater prevalence of adult spinal deformity. The success of surgical treatment uh, centers around multidisciplinary approach with both surgeons and neurologists. Um, data on long-term complications after spinal fusion, this challenging cohort remains sparse. Um, and again, uh, but a little more detail, the purpose of the study was to evaluate the outcome um, of patients with Parkinson's disease who underwent uh, adult spinal deformity surgery and compare them to a propensity match control uh, cohort of patients without Parkinson's disease. Uh, they especially evaluated hospital-related um, parameters, medical and surgical complications, and the rate of revision surgery. So between 2009 and 2013, patients' information was retrospectively reviewed using the New York State Statewide Planning and Research Cooperative System database, um, which is a comprehensive all-payer data reporting system. All adult patients who were admitted for the diagnosis of ASD or neuromuscular scoliosis and underwent thoracolumbar spinal fusion procedure of two or more levels were included. Patients were then subsequently stratified into whether or not they had diagnosis of Parkinson's disease as defined by the ICD-9. Um, they had many exclusion criteria. I don't want to discuss them all in detail, but it gives a good impression um, how the group tried to work with a very well-selected cohort. Um, just for instance, all kind of fractures, um, spinal infections, or metastatic, metastatic cancer were excluded. Um, to reduce the confounding bias, a one-to-one -one propensity score match for age, uh, DAO index, and number of fused spinal levels was performed. Univariate analyzers were used to compare demographics, individual medical and surgical complications, and any other complications, as well as any subsequent uh, revision surgery. Multivariate analysis was used to identify independent outcomes predictors with odds ratio, 95 confidence intervals reported. So overall, a total of 576 patients um, propensity scored match were included in the analysis um, with exact 288 patients in each cohort. Um, demographic characteristics between Parkinson's disease and non-Parkinson's disease cohorts didn't show significant variations for age, DAO index, and um, the number of spinal fused levels. In addition, the distribution of sex, race, and insurance providers were also comparable and showed no significant difference. But patients with Parkinson's disease incurred higher post-operative hospital lengths of stay, and the total charge across visits were higher. Each cohort exp uh, uh, experienced comparable rates of individual complications, except um, post-operative hematoma and surgical complications. Both showed significant higher um, rates in Parkinson's disease patients. However, the overall mortality didn't differ between the cohorts and um, the rates of medical and overall complications, as well as the rate of revision surgery, were comparable. In addition, uh, binary logistic regression showed that Parkinson's disease was not associated with an increase in total complications um, or revision surgery with a two years follow-up. Um, discussion. The authors discussed that the literature supports the findings of increased uh, rates of surgical complications in hematoma. For example, Baker and Bouillet also found higher rates in hematoma. 
Um, furthermore, they quote two studies with higher rates of revision surgery and complications, I guess, with the intention to support their findings regarding the higher surgical complication rate. But we should keep in mind that we can actually also evaluate these findings as in contrast to, due to the fact that neither the rates of revision nor the overall complication rate significant, were significant higher in the presented study. In addition, there are also studies which couldn't find any difference in both cohorts. So, um, conclusion, patients with uh, Parkinson disease incurred higher total charge across um, adult spinal deformity surgery related visits. The rate of medical conditions and revision surgery were comparable. We saw a higher post-operative um, surgical complication rates in patients with Parkinson's disease at a minimum of two years follow-up, and Parkinson disease was not identified as predictor of increased odds of uh, adverse outcomes. Thanks very much. So this is great, uh, and this is a completely different perspective what I just gathered from Dr. Gayumi. So Isidore, Izzy, how, how can you make sense of this uh, presentation? Uh, they say that PD is not a negative predictor for more complications. We just, uh, basically all of us are always uh, worried about operating on Parkinson's patients. What's your thought on that? Patient-specific, symptom-specific surgery. T take each patient uh, as they are, define what the problems are. We know that Parkinson's is a progressive neurological disorder that ultimately results in structural spinal disorders. Uh, we have to time our intervention appropriately. It is difficult surgery. You have to base the decision to have or to recommend that operation on risk versus benefit. And you discuss that with the patient um, and you just move ahead each patient one by one. With these small series that we're seeing and hearing, I, I'm reluctant to make broad judgments and statements that we should not be operating on Parkinson's or we should be operating on Parkinson's. Hey Jens, can I ask a provocative question? Anytime. Okay, so, and, and absolutely no disrespect, man, um, but I think sometimes the concept of saying patient-specific surgery may be not in our hands, but in the general populace hands, a cop-out to say, well, I can do really whatever I want. And the fact is there is a role for, for data and predictive analytics. And in fact, the people that are approving our surgeries are looking at these things, not at they don't, they don't care whether it's Jens Chapman or Izzy Lieberman. They group us all into a box, which is basically um, this is the way that these things should be done with these particular circumstances. So, you know, I don't know. We got to we kind of kind of find some some maybe some happy medium and some norms that we all can agree upon. Couldn't agree more. And again, uh, we had a chat going on about this. Uh, the NHS has done that with this national database gathering. The NHS is much maligned, but they, in their national database, found that, for instance, for spinal deformity surgeries, if your center does less than 48 spinal deformity cases defined as uh, more than three levels of fusions, interestingly, um, uh, you have a way higher complication rate. So their first recommendation is to designate uh, deformity centers uh, because, again, their data, their big data, speaks towards that. So uh, this is underway, and I'm sure it'll hit our country uh, at some point in time. So thanks for that statement. I think we're at the top uh, of the hour, and maybe uh, in the last minute I can ask Dr. Oskudian to close us out, but not without making a pitch. Tomorrow morning we'll have an all-star spine trauma, sixth annual spine trauma conference. So log in to SSF TV uh, for a who's who, and we feature Michael Failings with brand new pharmacologic spinal cord injury thing. So please uh, take a look at us tomorrow morning uh, from 8 a.m. Pacific time uh, to noon on spine trauma. Rod. Uh, I think the comments Scott made are um, actually uh, very um, uh, apropos to this Camptochormia concept because I think one of the things, if you look at the literature, there's really not much there, number one. Number two, most of the literature that we have, and I think this goes back to you know, um, data in spine surgery, 
it's kind of all over the place. And I think we underreport our complications, which in the end, it hurts us um, when you look at, uh, you know, different diseases or small populations and stuff. So um, I think for me, next time I see a Camptochormia patient, I'm really going to think about potentially getting um, a functional neurosurgeon to see them to see if there's anything they can do from a DVS perspective before uh, doing a spinal fusion. Thanks, everyone. Thank you and hope to see you tomorrow morning. And uh, thank you, Izzy, for all your great comments. And Scott, uh, stay safe and have a great weekend. Have a good weekend, Take care, everybody. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.